show with me, Swin Dobson, and him, Tim Patton. Today we're joined by Terminal Philosophy to discuss how do people come to believe what they believe? Tim. In terms of beliefs, I'm not talking about minor matters, although what separates minor and major matters may be the question in itself, um, but rather the more important questions. I mean, one of the key choices to name a given one is whether you're a theist or an atheist. Um, this remains a relevant question. In the past, it was extremely relevant. Another relevant question, arguably, whether you're a capitalist thinker or a market oriented or more like a communist or a syndicalist or, you know, whether whether it, some sort of that syndicalism or Marxism is true. Again, that was a major still, I'd still argue this continues to be a major two beliefs. Now, with all beliefs, there's always some question. How do you know if person X holds that belief and what someone who holds that belief look like? So, like, you know, if if I think that person, if that person is a carpenter. And he uh, says he's a carpenter and he, you know, fixes furniture, builds furniture, um, people sell to his goods and he identifies identifies the carpenter. That that sort of meets the thing, meets the standard, at minimum, a Wittgenstein standard of like what a carpenter is. And you can say, well, what is an ideal carpenter? I don't I don't know. But like it's good enough to say that, you know, that person is a carpenter. If, If Swithin, for example, says that he is a Christian and he publicly says that, you know, he attends church semi regularly. By all intents and purposes, it's he's a Christian. You know, if Hans Hoppe says he's a uh, uh, libertarian and, uh, you know, he runs a libertarian institute of some variety, well, maybe he's not a libertarian anymore. Uh, he's a libertarian. The same way with Ben Burgess. If he says he's a Marxist, other people call him a Marxist. He writes for Marxist-friendly positions. So that, in that sense, there's a sort of like – as long as there's some sort of social recognition. Now, whether or not, for example, that the founder of Rhode Island, who was bro- – bro- who, who probably only thought like 20 people were saved, thought that all the other Christians in the world were actual Christians and not just heretics that were worse than um, a pagans. That's not really the issue at play here. Like, so like if Ben Burgess or Swithin aren't true Christians, that, that that's not really the thing in itself. But so like if people hold beliefs about certain things and it's generally accepted that they believe them, and I'm not just talking about like whether like tea is better than soda or like, you know, quote unquote minor matters, because you do get the question of free will, which I think we can we can take that rabbit hole if we want to take that rabbit hole. Um, but, you know, most people agree, at least on an actual – people don't live like they're determinists. Like that's that's what – go back to our ad hominem episode we did like um, three months ago. People don't live like they're ad hominems. So, like, like, so people come – people seem to have beliefs. They seem to have some, at minimum, post hoc rationalization for why they believe um, what they believe. Now, again – on like important questions, like do you think um, the you know uh, vaccines are good, or do you think that uh, 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 I'm trying to think of it. Do you think the uh, president of the United States is fairly elected, or do you think that um, JFK was uh, you know not as was just assassinated by a lone gunman? Like there are certain important questions at a given time. It does really that there's sort of cost. Like if you think Bigfoot exists, there's not really any social cost. So there's a social cost part to belief that, you know, like like um, what you do and don't believe. And like on minor matters, you might just defer to experts and it's just irrelevant. Um, so, you know, you could just get into the sort of minor versus major thing. But again, I, I, I think there is a certain rationalization that can. So I sort of wrote some possible reasons how people come to belief. The first of Ken is arguments, evidence, reason. That's that's sort of like the first framework. Um, the next one will be like force, money, persuasion, like sort of thick persuasion. Like, oh, if you don't if you don't believe in this, you'll lose your job. Or if you don't publicly, if you publicly say you don't believe in this, you will lose your job, or you'll not be as hireable. That's a kind of soft, like, and I've been in this sort of outright, and then the, and the force indoctrination, education, propaganda. Now again, you just say, well, they're self propagandizing too. That's never why you could argue if people believe it. Again, one of the critiques the atheists will make of Christians is they're just indoctrinating their children. And of course, it's Brian Kaplan. But as Brian Kaplan would point out, like that you could also argue that it's genetic. That's another component that things you could make. That thirdly, you know, that people just inherit of something. They inherit the genes of their parents and their society around them. There's twins studies. So I sort of outlaid like those are like three types. So 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 um so start with TP here. I mean. What do you think ought to make someone change their minds? Like, I mean, what, what framework broadly would you sort of set up to explain why do people come to believe what they believe? 
And again, I'm sort of sidestepping the free will question. But if we want to go down that rabbit hole, we gladly can. TP, thanks for being on. All right. Well, thanks for having me once again. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think your, I think your, your, um, I think your impulse to initially sort of forego um, discussions of free will is fine, and we can certainly get to that here in a moment. Um, but um, I think it goes without saying here that we're definitely uh, deep within the epistemological realm of philosophy. I think uh, for the broad majority of uh, modern humans and how they come to believe what they believe is probably through it's, it's through a small collection of things and i think first of all it's probably through um i think it's probably a combination between their own culture i think it's out of uh pragmat like pragmatism and convenience and then i think lastly they'll probably arrive to reason so let me just uh give a quick sort of uh, breakdown of how I sort of view it, and then we can uh, dissect how reasonable or unreasonable it might be. But um, I tend to view how the, and when, when you look at humanity and how they come to believe what they believe, I'm sort of thinking of like a sort of a, a bell curve distribution with uh, the far left-hand side of uh, the bell curve being perhaps people who are in so-called authoritarian states uh, or, or uh, you know, uh, deeply um, either authoritarian or totalitarian states uh, that could, you know, and what we call totalitarian and authoritarian today is absolutely up for debate, but these are places arguably like North Korea or China, uh, perhaps Iran, Turkmenistan, Brunei, so on and so forth. Um, Many of the people, the populations of those countries might come to believe what they believe through um, through variables like propaganda or force. And, the, and and by which I mean, you know, these societies are probably very, um, they're probably very, uh, they're, they're much more oriented towards a collectivism than they are, say, the sort of hyper individualistic societies that you see in the Anglosphere and in the West. So. And then, you know, from that, uh, you know, we have before we started the before we started our broadcast today, we were speaking a little bit about Japan. And, you know, when you look at Japan, there's not much of an advocacy within Japanese society that encourages uh, hyper uh, individualism. Uh, it's more of a uh, collective culture. And uh, uh, from that, um, you know, there's sort of a benef the benefits of a sort of a uniform and functioning and pragmatic society. So that is sort of the left-hand side of the uh, distribution of the bell curve. Uh, you know, uh, you could say uh, global epistemology bell curve, if you want to call it that. And then in the center of the bell curve, the sort of the median or the mean, um, I think honestly, most people, and again, this is the majority of humanity, people just really come to believe what they believe out of convenience. And, you know, first and foremost, I, I think it's out of sort of convenience and expediency. And it's also, it, it comes out of uh, what is con, um, probably, probably their culture and then out of what is... Um, I guess what brings them more opportunity. So maybe that plays a bit into pragmatism, but it's a combination between uh, what is um, convenient and what has already uh, been sort of imported to them as a, as a sort of uh, sociological de default setting through their culture. Um, and then thirdly, uh, on the right hand side of the bell curve, you would have, say, uh, uh, the group of people and these are more academics, intellectuals, authors, bookworms, people who are philosophically inclined, who have a, an acute interest in the humanities. I would say that this group of people is more persuaded by reason and through uh, the sort of axiomatic deductions that are brought forth in many of these philosophical arguments. Um, you know, and this, and for myself, I suppose I'm sort of a combination between the second and third categories, where I've come to believe what I believe through sort of the the culture I was brought up in, uh, somewhat of what is pragmatic and convenient and expedient, but also I've had the benefits of having a classical Western education, and I've um, 
So I, I've had the benefit of exploring a lot of Western canon and philosophy and history um, and sociology. And so I've had a lot of time to think about these things and, and deduce uh, what uh, is what, what is a persuasive uh, thing to believe in what isn't through um, through reason and through uh, uh, through deductive logic and things like that. So I'm sort of a, a mix of the two. And the last thing I'll say here is that what's a bit interesting in the conversations of epistemology and free will and determinism and all that in the modern day is that now, and I'm sure it exists out there somewhere in the world, but I haven't read too many uh, philosophical works that discuss epistemology with the development of history in mind. Uh, and I don't, I, I guess you, this is a bit Hegelian, but what I mean by that is that you know, we alive today in 2022 have sort of the benefits of a long historical track record with us. So what I mean by that is, is that modern people at this stage in history, at this development in history, have the benefit of, uh, we, we, we've, we've had the benefit of a lot of political, philosophical, and moral experimenting having done for us already throughout the you know thousands of years of agricultural civilization we've already had a lot of hard work done for us so it's not like you know we're born and then we have to we have to toil over the possibilities well maybe we should jettison liberal democracy and and maybe we should try what the uh, the neo babylonians or the assyrians were up to or maybe we should try maybe we should try some sort of you know uh, uh stalinistic uh, authoritarian bolshevism Maybe we should try uh, something like, uh, you know, what the Mennonites are doing. Uh, you know, now all of those options might have some appealing dimensions to them or not. But uh, the fact is, is that uh, we we simply come to believe what we believe because we're a long product of historical experimenting. And um, not that I'm a Francis Fukuyama or neoliberal fan per se, but... Uh, we're sort of settling on these uh, these uh, common denominators of historical development, and that could be something like uh, Western neoliberalism. It could be uh, um, some form of authoritarianism. It could be some form of isolationism. So, um, yeah, the point I'm making there is that uh, you know we've had the benefit of a lot of people in the past who have ruled out some of these options through either war. Or judicial persuasion, or many, many other uh, variables. So, I, I think um, now perhaps you know you mentioned earlier, Tim, that you know foregoing free will as as initial as an initial vector of approaching this whole conversation might be worth um, uh, might might be worth sidestepping for the time being, and that's fine. Uh, I'll also add that perhaps this conversation and this variable of historical development may not be entirely uh, either relevant or worth it to discuss. That's almost like epistemology with Hegelian historical development in mind. Perhaps that's not entirely necessary, but uh, I think that's a point worth uh, bringing up in this in this conversation, because I think that's something that a lot of modern people take for granted. But uh, that, those are just some of my initial thoughts, and so I'll, I'll hand it back to you guys. I would um, go back to TP's original tripart distinction. I think that that's broadly speaking correct uh, as to how people can believe what they believe. Um, so that, that would be reason, culture and sort of pragmatism. Um, I can't remember who said it uh, recently. Uh, I think it was academic agent that said if there was a fascist takeover, there'd be a lot more fascists. Um, because well, if if the fascists are in power, then it's going to be politically expedient for you to become a fascist. And so lots of people are currently in HR departments enforcing um, LGBT, XYZ, et cetera, et cetera. Probably got hieroglyphs on there now uh, as well. Um, they would start they, they would start enforcing fascist orthodoxy at work. Why? Because the fascists are in power. Um, so I, I do think uh a lot of it and, and i don't actually think it's conscious i think a lot of people just have a general um belief well a, a, a general incentive to climb the social hierarchy and so just by osmosis and not being deliberately cynical just happen to take on the beliefs which happen to be most advantageous to uh to them um 
I, I, I think that's um, that's definitely the case. Then the question arises, well, how else can we get? How did the police become socially advantageous? And then you then you're sort of talking about, you know, um, where the country is, what kind of uh, beliefs are going to be more suitable for uh, well, in, in well, in one dimension, uh, improving your own material conditions. Um, which is going to be different in different circumstances, depending on what the best way is of exploiting the resources around you. Um, I would say when it comes to most people, uh, I think, as uh, TP mentioned, I don't actually think most people reason to their positions very much. Stephen Marnie was uh, often repeated. Uh, you can't reason people into out of a position that they weren't reasoned into. Um, because most people um, just sort of uh, absorb it. And I think an interesting test case for this, and I haven't done as much research on this as I as I possibly should have done, uh, but I think the paradigm example of how people have changed their views on things is actually the changing uh, social acceptability of smoking, which has gone from basically something that was entirely normal 20 years ago to now something which is basically verboten, uh, especially verboten anything uh resembling close to being middle class or above uh, you can still smoke cigars and stuff that's okay but genuine cigarette smoking is just like no it's not allowed now the question is why do people change their view is it because people knew it was well i'm now going to assume that smoking is bad for you at health I did, and i did read somebody recently who, who claimed that he was a uh, like a personal trainer who smoked organic tobacco without any of the toxins in and said it was good for him. He smoked five a day. So let's just bracket that and assume that the standard medical story with respect to mainstream cigarettes is true. Well, that didn't really change much from 2000 to 2022. There's not really the, the knowledge has changed. So why did people change their behavior? Well, it seems to be one of changing. I would expect if you look the types of people who smoke in sort of films, it was probably generally towards more bad guys rather than heroes. Um, and then there was also government policy, which basically stopped it being smoked in communal areas, which then made it so that it ceased to be a social norm um, in a way that it had previously been. Um, so smoking is certainly something which um, could look to. And also interestingly as well, as I mentioned before, the LGBT stuff. Uh, recently, uh, a broadcast of the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man 1 or 2 from the early 2000s had a joke edited out of it um, because uh, one of the characters I remember who says uh, basically says, oh, yeah, what about you and your boyfriend or something? Because he was being effeminate or something. And they cut that out. And that was perfectly normal in 2000. So there's a big about face on that. And I think a similar trajectory with uh, the well, different from smoking because obviously it doesn't currently happen in public places although I, I that, that is of course possible um so i, I think that's uh true um so I, I think it's relatively minimal the people who believe what they believe uh, now tp raised something about authoritarian regimes and by propaganda i would actually say to some extent that the situation in the west with respect to propaganda is worse because people in the West don't think there is propaganda in the same way that you probably. Well, that's the question would arise. To what extent do people in North Korea realize they're getting propaganda? I suspect they probably probably think they are getting it. And so I would expect the average North Korean to be relatively skeptical of whatever the North Korean government says. Just because of their own personal experience of what they say and what actually happens. Now, I could be wrong. But in the West, we have the idea of we have the free press. Um, but what seems to happen is we have this sort of free press, but then the the only views or the mainstream and the biggest news uh, items basically all agree on all basic values. And they bombard you with it. So the best example of that would be, well, lockdowns in 2020 is probably the best example. Uh, no minority view of why this might not be a great idea was ever heard. And of course, related to the propaganda, the whole thing. Oh, no, don't go out. You'll kill grandma. Um, but few people, I think, still think that there was actually it was a propaganda campaign, 
even though it was obviously a propaganda campaign. And that's in, not including official government propaganda, but basis what the newspapers wrote. Um, so that would be my general take on the issue. I think we can bifurcate the 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 so so say the the normal quote everyday or you say trolls and the elites or the upper middle class. Um, at some point somewhere along the line, I think reason has to play at least some role. And if it doesn't, then what are we even doing discussing things? Or at least we're just or or we're all just doing is understanding a kind of of kind of anthropology of like what people say to justify their beliefs. So so if it's all sort of force, there's no sort of reason out there, no sort of evidence, then in a sense, conversation is just another method. I mean, this is sort of a, a TLDR version of argumentation ethics in a sense, um, which is maybe correctly maligned or not maligned. I don't know. But so at a minimum, the elites have to believe like, you know, uh, Lenin, Trotsky, these guys had to convince themselves. And at the time, they weren't capital E elites. They were elites in waiting, for example, they had to convince themselves that this revolution was worth pursuing or not pursuing. Same way we go back to like Madison, Monroe, uh, 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 Jefferson, they sort of had to convince themselves. So, you know, there's a certain moment of history where there's lots of, there's things are in flux. There's questions that have to go back to TP's idea. There's questions that have to be decided, like whether we should get to have the king or not to have the king, uh, you know, to rebel or not to rebel. There's questions, there's options. I think in those sense, it's in those circumstances, there's clearly like there's some people are making decisions and they're using arguments, evidence, you know, in the same way that like, you know, if you, you know, you have two options for, let's say, a job or two options for a house, you're going to look at them. You're going to use, you know, you would use reason to come. Well, this house is cheaper. This house has a better neighborhood or this house, blah, blah, blah. And you can sort of come to a decision. So in that sense, I think at some point. Somewhere along the line, like John Calvin, for example, had to make decisions about like what, you know, or like the Lutherans when they set up their, when they rebelled from the RCC or the Anglicans, they had to make up. Decisions. Now, whether the proles or the everyday people actually went along with this analysis is a good question. I was recently went through the entire, almost through the entire uh, Machiavellian's book by um, uh, James Burnham, recommended by Moldbug and Thaddeus Russell. And. He sort of they bring up, I think, mosque. And this is sort of the point that uh, one of the later chapters, you know, the, the uh, I, I would say elites exercise agency and free will to some extent, to the extent that we can, in the same way that people buy houses. You know, you know, Germany didn't need to invade Russia, but somewhere along they, they believed it was a worthy action to do. Um, um, so so in that respect, I think I think to say that there is no evidence, um, what, you know, um, and I would say that. I would say one of the things I think is rational do come people. I, I think about this episode 100 we did was is podcasting a waste of time. I think one of my favorite sort of like uh, meta episodes we did. And, you know, one of the reasons why people might not question things is there's just nothing. There's nothing. There's no real point to uh, question. This is the Chomsky critique of like a uh, of, of political discourse too. like it's actually Chomsky had a radio, but probably had a we're talking about talk radio of talk sports radio. He said that talk sports radio, like people at least have some, like uh, it might be more rational for you to have like good views on football um, than, you know, whether or not elections, the, you know, cause you might get, you don't get in trouble for the views on football. You could get in trouble with the views on the election. So there might be rational to be ignorant. Um, <laughs> especially if you don't have any power, um, it, you know, to, to sort of like the truth will make you flee, so to speak. So I, I sometimes I sometimes sort of arbitrate that view. There's a sort of um, neatness towards not. Um, so like I might have views, but like and maybe I have them rationally evident, but there's nothing really I can do to act upon them um, in the way that elites could. And I, I don't really view myself as an elite in waiting, although if someone wants to put me in power, um, that would be great. Um, so on the minor matters, I think I think I would. I'll ask this question on minor matters. Do you think, you know, let's say you're buying a house or a car like this. This is sort of like the classic bourgeois, so to speak, freedom, you know, and you use reason, evidence and sort of work to make a decision. And I think to use if you don't do that, like what, like if you're just, you know, some autonomous drone told by God or told by material forces what to do, then like 
at least we want to understand like what are those forces we want to at least like this is the free will thing like what are those forces telling you to do or not to do tp what do you make of this sort of spiel i just gave with respect to elites versus non-elites uh do you think that's an interesting you think that's a worthy uh break to sort of break them down um you know it's it's quite clear that like some you know random wage slave doesn't really change in the democratic party uh, but you know someone in in the state probably has a decision on ukraine that was made or maybe not maybe it's just sort of like the bureaucracy alive or it, it's just sort of sleepwalking toward a thing tp right i yeah that's an interesting question so you know your your question as to whether or not uh, as i understand it you know are are these elites making decisions on behalf of the state by you know by you know reason alone or you know are, are they sort of sleepwalking into things haphazardly because of the complexities and um and uh, internal contradictions of the bureaucracy well uh that's you know it's really fascinating i think it's probably a sort of um it's probably a mix between the the two sort of uh variables depending on the event itself i think for example that uh, with in regards to ukraine and in regards to this sort of western uh nato uh, support for ukraine in its defensive war against the russian invasion i think that many in the european union and in uh, north america and in the u.s state department and various other places have come to that um, support for Ukraine through, um, you know, I, I think that these people believe what they believe because they've been persuaded by it. But I also believe that all those groups I just mentioned, they are in somewhat, uh, I mean, they're, they're suffering the effects of, of living in a bubble. And now I know that that sort of cliche is stated all the time, but this is very, uh, this, this is very, this very much applies to people in think tanks Washington DC and the city of London, uh, in Brussels, um, I think you know to what I'm referencing here. These people are very much living within their own their own political um, artificial realities, meaning that um, they're, they're making plans on paper that don't necessarily exist in reality. So meaning that, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna sanction Russia because uh, because Russia, you know, because Putin is bad and evil and he he invaded Ukraine out of nowhere, and we're going to sanction them, and their economy is going to suffer, and we're going to not going to suffer any consequences. And then, and then in reality, what happens is that, okay, so that put the Germans in the position of freezing over winter because they made the brilliant plan of shutting down all of their nuclear power plants. And then, uh, you know, okay, so they've just they just negated themselves 40 to 45 percent of their own gas imports from Russia. Russia then um, you know, foregoes any further construction or development on the uh, Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, and then they put themselves in this uh, economic, this energy economic crisis. Um, and then all, all sorts of other things too. Uh, they, they didn't, th there's obviously just no long-term planning here. There's no long-term conscientiousness about what they're doing. So yeah, I, I believe that these people came to these these uh, these beliefs about Russia and Putin through their own reason, so to speak. But the, the that reason, in air quotes, was delivered by them by a set of limited factors that were sort of, um, I guess you could say, self fulfilling or or self. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? self-approved within their own sort of think tank and and uh echo chamber uh variables so um yeah i do believe that they do co come to that through reason but uh, you know another another uh point i'd like to address too is that uh what swithin brought up uh earlier was that um i, I think it's absolutely true that western people come to believe what they believe uh because um you know through what they're told in the media and what we're told in the media, at least I, I believe, and I think we can all agree on, is absolutely a form of propaganda. However, how it's presented is to make it seem like it's not propaganda. Like we're 
we're here, you know, I mean, the the brilliant people at CNN or at MSNBC or Fox News, like we're we're here for you. <laughs> this is all this is all in the name of uh, you know an open and free democracy. But uh, it's obviously clear with a little bit of digging that um, the American media apparatus is absolutely creating propaganda because uh, look look no further. Probably one of the most blatant and acute examples I can give of recent memory is. Uh, the so-called Trump-Russia collusion. I mean, it was so, uh, the coverage about Trump and the supposed uh, um, support he was receiving from Russia the, the, from, you know, via collusion. I mean, watching Rachel Maddow and all these other uh, media figures, it, it just seemed like professional wrestling. It was just so schizophrenic and it was just a 24-7 uh, it was just a 24 non 24/7 nonstop bombardment of paranoia and frothing at the lips and uh, you know this is the end of Trump and and, and you know the, they they were talking about it as if there was a smoking gun when in fact that that smoking gun just never came uh, so yes but you know again but whereas if you were to look on the flip side of that places perhaps like North Korea or China, Iran, uh, Turkmenistan, um, so on and so forth. I think that, you know, people in these countries are probably actually smarter than we give them credit for. It's just that they're, you know, that they probably know that they're receiving a type of propaganda. And I think that people in the West do too, but a lot of people just go along with these things because, um, well, many people are selfish and they're just going along with what what is expedient and what sort of supports their own worldview and what is pragmatic because again I think that the majority of humans aren't interested or are bored or are confused by the complexities of philosophical epistemology and not many people are uh, they're not toiling over the you know, let's say the Kantian analytic synthetic distinction or a priori and a posteriori uh, distinctions. That's just too abstract. You know, I mean, people in elections are not persuaded generally. They're not persuaded by, you know, the support or or, or uh, opposition for certain parties or, or candidates by Hegelian uh, models of history. They're, you know, that they're, this is all... That's all just abstract, distant concepts that people are just aren't interested in. And people usually are going for what is convenient, pragmatic, what is beneficial to them and their family and their friends and their, you know, maybe to a slightly lesser extent, their community. So um, I hope that that was, I know that's a bit of a shotgun uh, <laughs> spread in, in response to both of the, your responses. But uh, yeah, let's. I suppose. Uh, what are what are your your thoughts on all that? I would say when it comes to the uh, U.S. State Department in respect to Ukraine and say the German um, energy policy, and then with the policy with respect to Russia, um, I think whilst a lot of these people would seem to claim that they have a a general uh, consistent view. What they mostly concern about is what they think, especially the sort of middle class uh, bureaucrat types, is uh, what's going to give them the highest social standing. And it doesn't matter to them that the energy prices go up massively, because they're going to be able to afford it anyway. It's not them, so it doesn't matter. Now, they might not think like that, but it means that they're not attentive to the fact that. Um, those costs will rise significantly. I mean, um, a number of years ago, apparently Boris Johnson, before he was prime minister, was asked how much was uh, a price of the loaf of bread. And he was going, um, um, well, what I can tell you is how much a bottle of champagne costs. Um, because he, he simply didn't know what the price of bread was. So, so it's not going to weigh in on them in that way. And the fact with the the Ukraine Russia thing. It's like, well, renewable energy is good and gas is better than coal. Nuclear is icky and bad because of Chernobyl. Therefore, we need to be support solar, wind, and natural gas. Oh, but then Putin man bad. So uh, no, we've got to probably oppose the uh, 
Well, I was going to say the mongoloid hordes, but uh, they probably wouldn't want to describe it in that way. Uh, but that's effectively the um, the view that they take. Um, so I, th I think that really kind of explains. It's not that they're irrational; it's just that their their particular interests don't make them attentive to certain areas. Uh, Tim brought an interesting uh, point of whether or not uh, everyday people use reason and evidence, and I think that's true. They do. I wouldn't want to say the view that people are um, are irrational in a certain sense. I think an interest. I think a reasonable distinction here is to what extent people are uh, rational when it comes to means and when they come to ends. I think most people are rational in certain respects relative um, relative to means. Given a particular goal that they have, they will generally come to a reasonable conclusion of how to achieve it. What they don't really th think about, though, is their end. So when they're thinking about a house, for instance, their their goal may be, well, I want a bigger house that's nicer, and so I'm going to get the best out of my money. Um, but the question is, is that really a goal that they should have insofar as this is going to mean they're going to go away from most of their family? Well, a lot of people today might think, well, I should go where they get a better job and get a better house. Now, whether that's the right conclusion is another question. So I think that when it comes to rationality, people, I think where the blind spot mostly is with ends. Now, in a sense, can you really always clearly demarcate between what's a pure means and a pure end? There seems a bit of a continuum there. But I think as a, as a general distinction, I think that's true, that you can to some extent distinguish you know, to, this is to a large extent a means you know you get on a bus i mean do you like going on the bus well maybe so it's an end in certain respects but primarily it's a means because if you didn't get you to where you wanted to go you wouldn't have gone on it to begin with um so um that would be so i i wouldn't so i'm saying I'm, i don't want to say people are irrational uh, as such it's it's just that the goals that they are attempting to achieve obviously of course you could always say everyone's always trying to make themselves better off and take the sort of formal egoist position um but um but when you get down to concrete you know what goals do they think is actually going to make them better off those i think are generally unreflexive people are generally unreflexive when it comes to that tim any comments at all the unreflective part is, is I'd say, is partly the uh, crux of the issue in, in a way. Um, I, I'm sympathetic to the view that um, an unreflective life is actually a better life, uh, which is a sort of non, which is sort of a vulgar position to defend, um, considering I read a quite a, well, a fair amount and have a podcast here. But I, I do sort of symp sympathize it because, in a sense. You know, like those people in North, North Korea, those common people in North Korea. If they, like one of the reasons I brought up the elites was, for example, the elites have the ability to search things out without really any consequence, as long as they don't like unless unless it destroys their ability to operate, like they're just sort of corrupt. It's sort of a, it can no longer go along with the system. Like there's a, there's a Marxist film, The Metropolis, I think um, one of the kids of the elites overthrow. I forget the exact plot of it. I actually watched it in German. In college ones um uh, but the like they're you know looking into things is dangerous in a certain sense um so so like the you know this you, you brought up like that everyone's just going for determinants but this this is also true for like you know like if you're if you're like for swith and like or, or like take ed fazer i'll use a third person like i i it would take a lot like if ed fazer came out as a um i don't know if he came out as a uh, a Marxist, or let's say he came out as a social justice warrior or liberal, um, or like a like a Marxist determinist atheist or something like that, that would cost him a lot of things. Um, like you know, that would cost him a lot of things. It's like this is sort of the atheist critique of a lot of like Christians. Like, well, what would it take you to change your belief in this? You know, well, it would destroy my whole social structure. You know, and they'll use that as an evidence to like that's the real reason to believe. But as you know now. Ravi Zakaragi is much more lying, but he would make the argument. I think Todd Lewis has made the argument too. Um, that like that also applies for like people who work for mainstream institutions too. So you know, it's um you know like um the, the social sort of context you have you know like if you reflect on things and you find your institution to be icky, so to speak, by the reflection, what do you actually do 
with your said beliefs? Do you change them? Do you abandon the institution? It's a good question. Um, uh, so in this re respect, like it may be good to be a little bit ignorant of things. Now, now this is from um, the Machiavellians by James uh, 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 Burnham. I said, might have said Buchanan. I always mixed up the name. James Buchanan is the like 15th president of the United States. Um, James Burnham. Um, and this is from page 173. A man's conduct, that is his, his human action, is logical under the following cir circumstances. When his action is motivated by deliberately held goal or purpose. When that goal is possible, when the steps or means he takes to reach the goal are in fact appropriate for reaching it. Logical, context, logical conduct is common in the arts, crafts, and sciences, and frequent in economic activity. Pareto calls this the economic field interests. For example, a carpenter wants to make a table, the production table in his deliberately held purpose. This goal is normally quite possible. He assembles, he assembles lumber, tools, etc., and one applies them in a certain fashion. Thus, his conduct with respect to his activity is logical. Um, so, so I, my 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 uh, application here to you know logic, so to speak, or beliefs co construction is, you know, it, it it is dangerous to do self surgery on yourself for one thing, and but but elites have the capability to do it, um, but they also have more to lose by doing it. So so you know, I, I do think people have to reason about their beliefs. But there are costs to reasoning or not reasoning about your belief. So in that respect, I think the unreflectiveness, um, I don't know if we would want everyone to be reflective. I think I think if we made everyone reflective, that would be a very that might be a that, that might be a very bizarre world. Uh, you know, that would be you know, could lead to a bizarre outcome. That could be lead to an illogical outcome. You know, this idea that, that like myths function, you know, everyday myths. Uh, get get keep society functioning is actually what the view I at times hold that that if you if you if you investigate them um, they might they might fall away. This is sort of like why compared to like people like Chomsky and a lot of these Platonists, I'm somewhat reactionary in the sense that I think uh, that 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 society functions on some sort of um, uh, uh, lies, not on uh, not necessarily on on truth. The truth is quite ugly. So so in that respect, my uh, my interest here on like why do people believe what they believe? Like take take Michael Brooks. You know, one thing I once asked like t like, like Michael Brooks has very good crit criticism of like capitalism. I agree, he's dead now. But um, like if you if you're really that critical of capitalist, how can you function in a society that is? Now you could argue, well, there's the state capitalist, corporate capitalist, blah blah blah. That that's sort of like my opening out kind of like you know you get set aside definition disputes. But how do you function in the said society if you think said society? Do you hold that belief? So to speak, you know, if you hold that belief that it, things are really bad, so to speak, how do you function in said site? Which we sort of touched on already that hominin episode too. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, you don't change. You could, you could, you sort of have to sort of like, you could change your belief. You could say that actually it's quite good when you're working towards something. But I do think the uh, belief question there, um, you know, and again, you could view more distant views, like you know, like Julian Assange, for example. He clearly made a decision somewhere along the line. It was probably going to get him into trouble, quote unquote trouble. Not 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 in like the moral sense. Like like I don't think he's doing anything wrong per se. But look, there's an example. Um, I don't think he was just like, uh, you know, he had agency to make his decision. Edward Snowden had agency to make his decision. They're not they're not stupid by the normal definition of stupid. Not handicapped. You can't say that. Although the therapeutic state might try to argue they're mentally ill for engaging in that um, kind of actions. Um, um, but I, that, that's, that would be my, that would be my thing on the reflective question. It might be dangerous to reflect on why people believe or don't believe and then act. Cause this to me is a follow-up to our ad hominem episode. Um, because one of the things, the ad hominem thing, Steve, is people will say X, but do Y. So the question is, which is true? Is Y true or is X true? Is the action true or is the belief true? Now, sometimes people say X and do X. So this is one of the things I like about the trads and the paleos. They say family is important. They have families, right? Um, for more like secular liberals who have families, spend most of their time with families, and then alternatively say, no, actually career and uh, career and secularism is the most in, in important thing. Yet if you look at their own lives, and this is what Charles Murray will make fun of. They're kind of like um, they live. Charles Murray would say they live left. They 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 think left, live right, so to speak. Um, so in my opinion, in my opinion, the ideal thing would be you have X and X parallel. Your beliefs and actions are parallel. But if that's not possible, 
what do you, what, 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 what is to be done there? And then which one do you get rid of here? So I gave a sort of long rambling response. Sorry for filibustering here somewhat, TP. But what do you make of this? Like, Swithin talked about the reflective thing, but you know, what, what will be reflecting on your own beliefs and how do you come? I don't know how I necessarily come to my beliefs. I would say they just sort of just, um, I would, I would say that a lot of them would just stem from my social environment and my genetics. If someone really questioned me, like, you know, Swithin once forwarded me a theory about kinship selection for families. I thought that was an interesting article, like the, the that, uh, you know, like the idea that we, that people who are somewhat vaguely related have similar beliefs. Um, that's, that's an interesting idea. Um, that doesn't really surprise me, so to speak. Um, it's actually quite logical if you think about it. Um, so TP, what do you make of that? Like, if, do you think X and X should be in accordance? We think, and if they're not in accordance, what, what do you do? TP? All right, that's a, that's an interesting question. Yeah. So if I can restate the question for myself, it's probably something like, uh, you know, do beliefs and their corresponding actions, do they actually correspond? Are they, uh, you know, are, are, are these things uh, commensurate with one another? And well, the answer is both yes and no. I suppose it, ex it really depends on the external factors. So say, for example, um, uh, Adolf Hitler in the Third Reich. Well, I think due to many external events um, in, in, in the realm of foreign policy, I believe that Hitler really did believe what he had to in terms of trying to conquer, a, you know, and, and eke out a Lebensraum for the so-called Aryan people. And he sort of followed, you know, he, he, he came to a, a so-called logical conclusion to what he had to do for Germany during uh, the Second World War. I, I you know, Sometimes you, with with people like Stalin or Hitler, Mao, Pol Pot, um, Mussolini, Salazar, uh, uh, Gaddafi, uh, all sorts of people, um, you have to sort of now, of course, I guess this is a case by case basis, trying to be as careful as possible here. But in in many cases, you have to people you have to take people at their word. Uh, perhaps a better way of looking at this is. Um, Julia Assange, Julian Assange and uh, Edward Snowden. Um, I I tend to think that uh, Julian Assange is a conscientious enough of a person to know that you know when he did leak a lot of the material that he did. I'm certain that he had some sort of inkling of an idea of how consequential it might be. I think that he probably thought that he would have received more legal support from state that um, that he would have, uh, because I believe he's being held in Great Britain, I think he, he thought that he might have been able to, you know, blow the lid wide open on, you know, international corruption in, in, in the United States and Great Britain, yeah. again, some of these Anglosphere governments, but uh, he probably failed to anticipate that uh, just how deeply corrupt a lot of these uh, states actually are, and that... Um, you know, he, you know, he gave away confidential information that was potentially uh, dangerous for militaries, uh, for the British and American militaries in the Middle East. But, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, was it so compromising that it led to the deaths of troops? I, I don't think so. I mean, the possibility was there, apparently, but I, I didn't, I never, I, I was never made aware of any evidence that that was the case. So, in Julian Assange's case, I think his beliefs and his actions corresponded. They were commensurate with each other. However, he had to pay the consequences of his beliefs and his actions because, unfortunately for him, these Western governments are much more corrupt and they're more secretive about their corruption than I think most people are aware. In places like North Korea, it's probably more blatant for them in places like the United States, uh, it's much, much more, it's, it's just, it's just more crafty and more well concealed than people. So, um, sometimes people have beliefs and actions that don't correspond. And the reason they don't correspond is out of, um, it's out of pragmatism or perhaps even selfishness or expedience or, it's out of the desire to uh, maintain some sort of 
culture or identity or religion or ethnicity or something like that. So uh, the case, uh, you know, a case of this might be the Likud party in Israel with um, being, you know, unnecessarily aggressive towards their neighbors in, in the Gaza Strip or in the West Bank. Um, you know, I, you know, by and large, I think it's probably fair to say that the Jewish religion is not this, you know, imperialistic people or or you know conquering people say of like you know Muhammad in North Africa in the uh, um, you know in the seventh century uh, AD it's more that uh, you know they're you know this Likud party is uh, doing what they think is necessary in order to maintain a, a safe and free Israel by uh, you know uh, conducting these aerial bombardments in places like Gaza and the West in the West Bank, so that might be you say that that could be some something like a an example of beliefs and actions not always corresponding not always corresponding because of the uh, interest of uh, culture and pragmatism. So yeah, that's sort of a um, I, I would say that that's that's just sort of some of my initial thoughts, and you know perhaps you know for the listener. Something that's a bit more, um, something that's more contemporary is again this uh, this war in Ukraine. Now, you know, just as a just as a very quick recap, what we were sold as far as Ukraine is that um, Vladimir Putin, out of nowhere, uh, out of no context whatsoever, decided to 180 no scope Ukraine and invade, <laughs> and uh, and he did this because. Uh, because he's evil, he's a tyrant, he's selfish, and uh, and he's just uh, he's unhinged. And and this was apparently due to no context whatsoever. And um, we don't want to hear anything about NATO, and we don't want to hear anything about uh, broken promises to uh, Russia uh, post 1991. And uh, blah, 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 blah. we just want to. This is this is what happened. Um, and we don't want to have any conversations about. Uh, uh, Hunter Biden being on the board of a Ukrainian gas company, and we don't want any conversations about uh, Biden and uh, Biden and Obama um, forcefully removing a judge in Ukraine for uh, for nefarious reasons, and uh, we don't want to hear anything about the color revolution in 2014, 2015. And so, uh, yeah, th- there's a very, very you know specifically articulated package that uh, the Americans <clears throat> and the Western Europeans have been sold. Uh, the reality of it, I would argue, is that NATO's uh, very uh, subtle, aggressive moves, uh, meaning that uh, NATO made multiple promises to Russia that they would not expand into Eastern Europe. Well, that broke. That promise has been broken several times in the form of Poland joining NATO, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Uh, and several other countries, um, you know, and, and again, why you have to ask the question from a geostrategic point of view, why would Russia be OK with a hostile military alliance gaining further and further membership on its borders? This would be like China and Russia forming a new sort of uh, alliance themselves and then Mexico joins. Well, <laughs> yeah, if it wasn't OK for the uh, for the Cubans to set up missiles in the 1960s uh, via the Soviet Union, why would it be okay for the United States to set up camp in Ukraine? No one is asking themselves this question. Okay, so uh, you got you both might be asking, okay, well, what does this have to do with free will and epistemology and, and uh, why people what they believe? Well, again, just to reiterate, I think that many of the Western leaders leave all of this because it's what's being repeated ad nauseum in their state departments and in their cushy offices and in their uh, well-funded think tanks and in this sort of uh, severed from the world uh, environments that they live in. Uh, again, many people in Brussels are making, uh, you know, very, you know, black turtleneck elite out of touch. Uh, politicians are making decisions for people in Brussels. They're making decisions for Farmers with six or seven kids in the, uh, you know, on on the Hungarian plain or in, uh, you know, in the rural parts of the Netherlands. These people really are out of touch. There's a reason that these out of touch, you know, quote unquote out of touch politicians are a meme, because they exist today and they make decisions that only exist on paper. Again, 
uh, Hitler was ordering invisible divisions around in the days of mid-1945 because he thought that a, um, you know, a, a general could break, one particular general with several, quote-unquote, uh, infantry and armored divisions could break the siege of Berlin, but that general only had a fraction of those forces in reality that Hitler believed existed on paper. So, so um, I guess what I'm getting here at is that, uh, I guess what I'm getting at here is that uh, many statesmen, many politicians, elites, academics, um, intellectuals come to believe what they believe yes through through uh through rational deduction but they too are just as subject to propaganda to personal beliefs because of a well curated echo chamber isolated um sort of environment from 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 the rest of society so despite all of the dialogue that might say otherwise so um Beliefs and actions don't always correspond because of the deference, you know, because of people uh, deferring to um, what is pragmatic, what is expedient, and what allows people their ultimate material gains. I think there are genuinely good people like Julian Assange. I think he, again, I think he just probably failed to realize that. Uh, Yes, on paper, you have all sorts of legal protections uh, in Great Britain or perhaps in the United States. But uh, those protections only go so far, depending on how much juicy red meat you have on the state itself. <laughs> and he's in that very unique position right now. So, um, and, you know, and again, in regards, as a way of interfacing my spiel there with Ukraine towards how people believe what they believe, that um, there are many, many reasons, uh, you know, beneficiary reasons why statesmen in the West are so anti-Russia and anti-Putin. Because if if NATO has a like you know, the most desired victory that NATO can have is perhaps like a collapsed Russia that ousts Putin, and what happens as a result is the installation of a pro-West, pro-NATO Russian Federation where Western firms and NATO countries have an uninterrupted access or perhaps a, uh, you know, a, an uninterrupted negotiation, favorable, nego favorable negotiations with Russia's oil and natural gas markets. Um, so so that, that, that's the interest that they sort of have. Will they oust Putin? I highly doubt it. The reality is that the rubles actually come back stronger than it was in pre uh, in its pre-war condition, and now um, Europe has been rejected multiple options of gas, like uh, from Saudi Arabia, from Qatar, from Venezuela, from the United States. It's uh, effectively out of options, and I think they 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 uh, rush or excuse me, Western Europe was depending on the uh, the power output capabilities from a certain. Uh, nuclear plant in Ukraine that has now been shut down. So again, they, they really uh, shot their big toe off, so to speak, when, uh, when, when they decided to uh, implement all these sanctions on Russia. And so I, I do believe that these, uh, that these uh, EU leaders are just, their beliefs and their actions are corresponding to what they are. Unfortunately, their beliefs are not well curated by the outside world and not in touch with their constituents like the farmers in uh, in the Netherlands or a lot of these work these uh, 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 these work uh, these uh, labor unions in Germany and many other examples so I'll, I'll leave it at that at that I would agree uh, with most of what uh, TP said I think one aspect we've missed though here is I do think people the cor people do not have beliefs that correspond with their actions um, basic of weakness of will. Um, and an obvious example would be uh, somebody who consciously wants to go on a diet and lose weight. And then they're in the store and they see the cake. They go, oh, I'm a bit hungry. I'm going to have one, it'll be okay. And then they eat it and then they do this regularly more than they think. Um, there's, uh, I just remember a study saying that people believe that they take in far fewer calories than they actually do. Um, and I think it is the case that they do believe that they want to try and do it and they're sort of 
they think that they're trying. But due to weakness of will, um, they um, they don't carry through with it. I mean, Paul in um, the New Testament, which which one it is, uh, mentions you know the, the things that I I kind of want to do, I I I, I don't do. You know, there's there's a there's a there are things that people want to do, but because of um, their sensory dispositions um, inclines them not to do it because I'm it's too hard hard physical work or doing something else is more pleasurable uh so physiologically then they don't do it so i think that's um that's another aspect uh i would say that's a note here um anybody any we come into one hour i don't have final comments uh, yeah let's do, yeah this will be my final comment it'll be a minute or two and then we'll we'll get going here um the weakness of will point i think um um, is a is a relevant point to be bring up because it does explain why you know if x the difference between x and y so to speak although you can of course just say social circumstances make it impossible for me to have my will uh manifest in in a way that is desirable so like now this this goes back to the nanny state ideal we'll just get rid of instead of instead of having people break the smoking or whatever they'll just you use the state to get rid of all the cigarettes in the market so to speak and or make them more expensive so to speak and that's how they'll sort of correct the will, um, get over the sort of weakness of will point. Um, so, but but that's still uh, interestingly enough, though, under that framework, people still want to do it. They just can't physically do it, or they don't want. Uh, so, that, like, you know, do you really want to do it? Um, so, which goes back to the you know the belief question is like, you know, which I opened with here. Sort of, again, I had sidestep two things, which is number one, I sidestepped the um, free will question, but I also sidestepped, you know, what does it look like? For a non like a person who identifies as a non-smoker but smokes all a day, um, there's a certain question like, you know, is that person really which which one is which one's incorrect and which one's correct? And I brought up Assange for example because I thought you know Assange is an honorable person because X and X are aligned. Um, in a sense, he's doing you know the uh, uh, the uh, I think I think the 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 deed so to speak, uh, uh, the witness of the deed or something like that. I think is a term that's been used. So that that would be my my final comment. Thanks for doing this discussion. TP, do you have any final comments here? Um, and then with it, and then thanks. Yeah, well, as always, uh, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, you guys have always had great conversations, um, and I yeah, I feel uh, I feel happy and honored to be a part of them. Um, I suppose my final comment here is just that um, yeah. I, uh, I, I suppose I'll just restate what I said uh, initially is that I think most people, whether it's in, uh, you know, majority of uh, humanity today, whether if it's in Cairo or London, Vienna, Tokyo or anywhere else, I think that most people come to believe what they believe out of a combination of their social environment, their culture, and then what is just pragmatic and what it makes life sort of uh, pragmatic and expedient. I, I think the uh, sort of ivory tower, highly contemplative um, mode of thinking, you know, like that of academics, writers, bookworms, those who are philosophically inclined, I think that that's actually a pretty small portion of the, uh, the bell curve distribution. Um, you know, m most people, uh, yes, I, I think for the majority of humanity, people are that there's a sort of smaller percentage of people who come to believe what they believe through reason. But I, I tend to think that that's something that's more emphasized and more apparent in the academic circles and in the humanities and things like that. And that's that's uh, I don't think that's neither depressing or good or bad. It's just more of a uh, this is more of an analytical reflection of how things work, in my personal opinion. So, anyways, um, but uh, before I go on any further, I think we I think we hashed out fairly well here today. And uh, as always, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks for joining us, TP. The rubles will be sent to you by post. I'd now like to thank everyone for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your friends and family, and anyone you think will find it of interest. Um, 
and please subscribe to us on Podbeaner and YouTube. The more subscribers we get, the higher we get in the search rankings and the more people can access this material. And if you'd like to contact the show for any reason, please contact us at mindcryingthebitshow at gmail.com. That's mindcryingthebitshow at gmail.com. If you'd like to contact the show for any reason, please contact us at mindcryingthebitshow at gmail.com. That's mindcryingthebitshow at gmail.com. 